Welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's continue with uh, Hebrews chapter 6. We've uh, just now had a discussion about falling away and what that means. Uh, let's see what else the author has to say in the uh, verses that follow. So if there are no more questions about falling away, uh, we can continue from verse 9. Verses 9 through 12 would be good to read. So could somebody please read that passage? Can you read Pastor? Uh, um, yes, Sasha. Sure. Don't be speaking this way at the end of the case. Beloved, we feel sure of better things that belong to salvation, for God is not unjust. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Through we, through we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have sown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you sow the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Abhinash. Uh, thank you, Asha, also for uh, attempting to read that passage. Uh, so this is in continuation with the encouragement that is being spoken to these Hebrew believers. Uh, and warnings as well you know, that uh, that that uh, the author added in there to tell them that it, it's not a good idea to depart from the faith okay so he's showing them the value of salvation he's showing them uh, you know how worthy uh, jesus is uh, and at the same time he's saying that if one falls away then uh, we will be cut off from all the goodness that god has offered through his son jesus christ so after the warning you know comes a very tender uh, way of encouraging the believers so notice the heart of his message is encouragement but he cannot uh, downplay the real issues isn't it so if he were not to tell the people about the risk of falling away. He's not being a true minister of God. So uh, he talks about that very serious warning. But since his heart is to keep them on track, he comes back in a tender way and uh, uh, you know encourages them. And he says, look, even though these, these things are there, all of these matters are a reality, I am confident. You know, we are confident of better things concerning you. Meaning, uh, not that you are going to fall away, but just letting you know, FYI, uh, we know that you are going to do better than all of this. Uh, and then, you know, he, he goes on. He goes on uh, with different things. He encourages them and says that our God is a just God, a, a God of faithfulness, without injustice the scriptures tell us that so he is he is a faithful god and a faithful god does not forget okay the uh, labor the uh, diligence the commitment the sincerity of those who follow him so he's letting these uh, Hebrew believers know that yes, you have suffered a lot, as the sister Rupa pointed out. They've been through their uh, fair share of challenges and losses, and all of that because they believe in Jesus and they are fervent uh, in the Lord Jesus. And he's just telling them, look, God will not forget, okay, your faithfulness and your love for Him, uh, and uh, that. You are also people who are givers. So he uses terms like you have ministered to the saints or you have given to others. So obviously it's when somebody is passionate about Christ and their Christian walk that they're not living only for themselves now. They're living for themselves, but they're also living for brothers and sisters in Christ, for the kingdom of God. So 
these were that kind of believers you know they had gone beyond just living for themselves uh, but they are now living for the kingdom of god and they have ministered in the past and they were ministering so that's what he is saying so currently these so called discouraged believers are also fervent believers they do minister and he is telling them look don't stop that because we have a god who takes notice he'll not forget no he is no man's debtor scripture says so if we have been faithful to him uh then the blessings that he will pour out on us are uh, incredible okay so that is the god who he is and uh, he's encouraging them to remember that god is a god of faithfulness and justice and uh, he goes on to say that it is his heart or as ministers of god it is the heart of the ministers to see each of these show the same diligence to full assurance of hope until the end or in other words you know the way jesus said you need to endure till the end F finish the race you no know, finish strong uh, is another way of putting it so don't give up hold on and in verse 12 another uh, good insight that we gain he warns them about sluggishness okay so what is sluggishness sluggishness is the opposite of uh, being fervent when we are fervent nobody needs to tell us you know that hey you have to do this you need to wake up you need to pray uh, you need to study the word you need to um, uh, you know pray in the spirit because we are fervent we we are passionate or, or the other term that we can use is passion we already have the passion but one who is sluggish is somebody who needs to be pushed somebody who needs to be reminded okay who needs to be helped in their journey someone needs to be there to take care of them but he is saying look don't become one of those people who do the right thing out of obligation but their heart is not in it that's sluggishness so he wants them and says do not become sluggish but instead do what imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises so he is letting them know that in this journey there seems to be a uh you know like something like a pause or the journey seems longer than what they have imagined but there are others who felt that way okay so imitate those we'll see later on you know he'll start talking about the heroes of the faith people who through faith have received what god spoke over their lives so basically he's kind of making the connect to that and he's saying that this is nothing new there have been so many people in the uh, in the kingdom in the faith who have felt like you uh, as if things are so slow as if god is not answering anymore and you know uh, the journey is too long but he says you know what their key was faith yes faith obviously without faith we cannot receive god's promises but the other wonderful thing there is patience so the importance of patience in the christian walk in the christian journey he reminds them of patience and says these are the two ingredients faith and patience so when we imitate those who have gone before us and have applied these two qualities what will happen we can push through further we don't have to become sluggish but we will be able to inherit the promises so in continuation to this he brings up one particular uh, example here and that is of abraham you know what a classic example of a man who waited who faced discouragement uh, and confusion himself so from verse 13 you know we read uh, 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 about abraham so could somebody please read from verse 13 to 18 Hebrew six thirteen to eighteen. Can I read? Yes, please. Yes. Um, Hebrews chapter six verse thirteen to eighteen. 
when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater to him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Divya. So in this passage... We have the example of Abraham. So what is so uh, uh, wonderful about Abraham? Faith and patience were a part of Abraham's life. And he inherited the promises of God. What kind of promise? You know, How did God promise Abraham? You know, we talk about the covenant. But here the word which is used. So you know, we read about uh, what God spoke to Abraham. So that's pretty... Um, elaborate you can read it from genesis chapter 12 uh, you can read it in genesis chapter 12 genesis chapter 15 where god stated many things i'm going to do this i'm going to do this to your descendants uh, this is what uh, the earth is going to be blessed because of you so there were many blessings which were spoken over abraham but when god said this what is the author trying to say? He's trying to let the listeners know that God is not a man when he says something to us, that God is a God who keeps his word. He's a God who keeps his, in this case, you know, he uh, over here, uh, he uses terms like um, swear, okay, uh, confirmed it by an oath. So he is telling the people that when God is saying that he is going to bless us or, or everything else, this is what salvation has and uh, you can taste of the goodness of salvation. God is very sure. He's not going to turn away. You know, man, we just saw how there is a possibility of falling away, turning back from God. But when you look at God in contrast to man, he is firm in his word as it is, you know, there is no need. Uh, I mean, I don't know, like I personally think, what is the need for God to make an oath? Because when God says something, he's not somebody who will turn back. Okay, we have, uh, uh, we, we read, right, in, in the book of Numbers, um, Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. So God's nature is already revealed to us. He doesn't lie. Okay, God cannot lie in the book of Titus. Uh, that, that's what it says. So though what he's stating is already pure and immutable, God is now making a covenant. And so there comes, you know, the, the whole thing of swearing, making an oath. So what is an oath? You know, what is an oath? Oath is generally considered as uh, a, a promise, but which, which has a legal sort of an angle to it. Okay, so when generally the, the term oath would be used in, in a more of a legal setting where uh, breaking it has consequences. So God is even bold enough to make an oath with the people whom he loves. And so he made an oath. Uh, he uh, made a covenant with Abraham and he swore uh, he did not have anybody to swear by. Okay, so whenever uh, somebody would make an oath like this, a commitment like this, they would uh, connect uh, another greater person or a, you know, like a like a standby or a surety. Uh, we these days we use terms like a surety. Who do you have for surety? So uh, there was nobody greater than God, and yet you know God is is the one who made this strong oath. So I'll just quickly read from verses 16 through 18. For men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. 
verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So he's saying, see, God's word, already it's true. But it's like he is, we'll see later on, you know, that, that, that even God, uh, in a sense, you can say he is the surety. He himself is the surety. He does not even need anybody. Uh, so in this way, when God confirms a promise to us, what is our understanding? We are not in a place of uncertainty. Surely he will do it. And so that's the encouragement to these believers. In the waiting period, you know, in the uh, crucible, uh, God is sure. He will come through and don't give up. Okay, no matter how uh, circumstances are. And you know, persecution was another thing that these people were facing. So it was very difficult for them. But the author is assuring them that God will come through. Be patient like Abraham. When you're patient, you will experience the promises of God. And one more very beautiful thing he adds there is, we, who are we? Or the believers and these Hebrew believers, he says, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So God has done something for us as believers. And that is, he gives us a place of refuge in himself. And how beautiful, refuge of hope. So already it's a place of protection in God. But in this place of protection, there is this opportunity to look ahead, hope. Right? There is a future uh, for the people of God. And that's the reassurance. Where does the author get this concept? In Numbers 35, um, there is this concept of cities of refuge where God had allotted uh, certain places where someone who had maybe accidentally uh, you know, committed a crime like murder, they could run to the place of refuge where they... Uh, don't experience any form of retribution over there. No, they could be safe in that place of refuge. Of course, they would be tried. And if if at all they were found guilty of uh, willful murder, then the uh, actions would be taken. But if at all, you know, something accidental had happened, uh, then they could be safe in that place for a while. And uh, once, you know, you have uh, the priest die, uh, they could come back and continue to live a normal life. So you see, that's the nature of God. God provides for restoration. I, I mean, we, we can't think of, um, you know, uh, or we can't say that God, God um, judges too quickly or uh, that uh, he, he doesn't provide help or there's no grace. We'll see later uh, in Hebrews 7.25, it says God, he saves to the uttermost. So God's grace is so amazing that when we think about it, it's again very, um, uh, you know, like it's a question mark that how can people even fall away? You know, when one has a long rope, uh, the longest rope possible, how can one even fall away, you know, let go of that rope? It's, it's uh, I, I don't know, it's incredible. But that's what we understand about the nature of God, a restorer, redeemer God, where uh, this God, he gives us this option of hiding in him. And in that place of hiding in him, you know, there is, he has packed up hope which is ready for us. And the author is reminding these people that how can you let go of a God who is so reliable, so good, uh, so caring, so loving, uh, you know, so mindful of us. It Don't even, you know, go uh, that route is, is what basically he's saying. So let's come back to verses 19 and 20. Uh, I want to request somebody to read these two verses, please. This hope we have as anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest for 
forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, thank you. Uh, so as we can see here, he continues to talk about hope. Okay. Hope uh, is that, that sense which says uh, everything will be okay and you know I have a future. Uh, God will go with me. God will go before me into my future. So that same hope, he continues to talk about it. And he says, hope is the anchor of the soul. That means that no matter what we are going through, you know, if we lose money, if we lose relationships, if we lose health, so many uh, losses, you know, people encounter, whatever we may lose or feels like we have lost, we can still make it provided we don't lose one important uh, entity and that is hope. If there is hope, you know, it's like a ship. When uh, a ship has been disengaged from the shore and it's it's uh, on a, uh, it's it's on sail, it's sailing now, and there are all these winds and a stormy weather. The friend of the ship in a stormy weather is the anchor. You know, even temporarily, if uh, the uh, the uh, person steering the the ship or the boat, if they just put down the anchor for a while. You know, and uh, find some stability. That's good. Okay, that that's helpful. And then they can continue on the journey. But at least there is an anchor for a difficult time or a difficult moment. And that anchor for us in our Christian walk is hope. So no matter what we may lose, one thing that we cannot afford to lose is our hope. Keep hope alive. Hope is the anchor of the soul and another thing that uh, the author states here is both sure and steadfast obviously you know an anchor is sure and steadfast and hope in Christ is an anchor which is sure and steadfast which enters the presence behind the veil so this is again the the um, understanding of the tabernacle and behind the veil presence behind the veil uh, uh, and later it talks about Jesus okay who entered for us that place that is the holy of holies who can enter the holy of holies only the high priest can enter and so we will begin to see already jesus has been introduced as the appointed chosen high priest we'll see more qualities of this high priest uh, uh, you know uh, uh, in the next chapter so while talking about that he's saying that jesus has entered the holy of holies and the hope which we are talking about, even that hope enters the presence behind the veil. That is simply to say that, you know, when we carry hope or uh, joy or uh, whatever it is, you know, our expressions uh, of uh, affirmation of the character of God, it is felt in the Holy of Holies. Okay, so we no longer are a part of earthly tabernacles. We don't go to earthly tabernacles to complete our worship. But we now are worshippers in spirit and in truth. But even in spirit and in truth, when we worship God, we can come to this place of the Holy of Holies in the presence of God or you know, very close to God. When we draw near to God, it's almost like we are in that place the holy of holies and what happens in the holy of holies you know we begin to express what is in our hearts you know our uh, our love our adoration our worship in this case we are talking about hope that enters the presence hope we express it right so whatever we express it's like saying that when i'm expressing my hope here on earth from the presence of God, it's felt in that tabernacle. And we'll see later on that the real tabernacle is actually in heaven, but God senses it. You know, God, uh, God sees that hope. That hope is seen in his real presence, which is up in heaven. Okay, so if you're like all confused about it, don't worry. Okay, so just another additional thought which the author has here. Uh, but that's how we see it. And then, of course, he goes on to talk about Jesus. And he says, 
another title okay we can list out the many titles which are given to jesus in the book of hebrews he says for runner for runner the greek word prodromos uh, is Uh, representative of a uh, uh, so representative of a person in the military forces okay who goes ahead and others follow that is the forerunner and obviously jesus is the forerunner because it is he who now has entered into the presence of god as a high priest and what do we do because of what he has done salvation that he has provided we are now able to follow him and we can enter into the presence of god so he has already entered that is the meaning of forerunner having become high priest forever see there more descriptions we saw appointed chosen high priest and now high priest forever okay uh, according to the order of melchizedek more descriptions high priest forever high priest according to the order of melchizedek now when we try to study jesus as a high priest in comparison to the you know uh, levitical order of priests and high priests we'll see some differences there and that's what we are proceeding to in uh, uh, chapter 7 but so far what have we looked at in chapter 6 we basically we have seen that jesus is a high priest there is this risk of falling away uh and it's very serious if we cross the boundary then it is impossible for somebody like that to even come back and then you know we go on to talk about uh, jesus who has entered into the presence of god and uh, uh you know he has now become our refuge and in that place of refuge we have this hope that is felt in the presence of god uh, okay so let me quickly pause there if at all there is something to talk about from your side and then we move on to chapter 7 here uh everyone's okay you <laughs> know quite uh, technical okay that's good are you still on the boat or decided to jump off for a swim or something yes ma'am learning well okay <laughs> that's good 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 to know amni and thank you for all your responses in the chat uh say uh, you seem to have something to say thank you pastor um i was also going to ask that uh, did we also see um jesus uh going behind the veil and which is the uh the inner courts of where the father is as a place of intimacy that Jesus Christ has brought us into yeah spot on that's perfect so jesus has also brought us into that place of intimacy with the father we can say that thank you pastor yeah thank you thank you say um all right let's move on to uh, chapter 7 uh, more technical things coming up you know chapter 7 so uh, please have an anchor okay don't don't uh, stray away in your uh, uh, you know your your thought process uh, so i'll do my best to keep it as simple as possible uh, chapter 7 verses 1 through 3 uh, could somebody quickly read that for us Okay, yes, you're feeling better, Rashmi. So it has been a work. Okay, no problem. Give it a try. For this Moshiach, King of Sam, Christ the Most High God, made Abraham a king in the slaughter of the king and blessed him. And to him, Abraham portioned a tenth part of everything. His first, by translation of his name, King of Righteousness, and that he is also King of Sam, that is King of Peace. He is without father or mother, or genealogy, had neither beginning of days nor end of life. By resembling the Son of God, he continues praise forever. Yes, thank you, Asha. So, uh, so far we've understood Jesus is a high priest. he is the high priest forever he is the forerunner who has entered into the presence of god 
and we saw that he is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So who is Melchizedek? That's the next question uh, we would have. Who is this Melchizedek? What is his order? Because we know about Aaron and the uh, you know the line of Aaron that his sons were the ones who were chosen to be priests and high priests. But Jesus is a high priest, but he's from another line. And that line originates from this person known as Melchizedek. Who is he? So descriptions about Melchizedek. He's the king of Salem. He was the priest of the Most High God. So there is a mention of this man called Melchizedek in, Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. You know, the, the priest that we are, the, uh, the reputation or the greatness of the kind of priest that I am depends on who I worship. So if I'm the priest of a great God, then I'm a significant or a very important priest. So the author, remember these Hebrews, they know about all these temple practices, priests, and, uh, and they have these concepts in mind. So he's trying to establish something greater than what they are aware of. He's saying, look, the priest of the Most High God, back in Genesis, okay, even before uh, uh, Israel, the 12 tribes and uh, the tribe of uh, the Levites, there is a priest and he is great because he's the priest of the most high God, Elohim, he's the God, priest of the most high God. Now this priest, he meets Abraham. When did he meet Abraham? In Genesis 14, you read about Abraham going into battle and uh, uh, you know uh, coming out victorious. And at that point, he meets this other king, and a priest. So Melchizedek, in a way, he is, uh, you know, he is giving us a new picture of a priesthood, a kingly priesthood. Remember the Bible, we, when we go to the epistle of Peter, we, we will see how we are kings, we are priests at the same time. And that is the order of Melchizedek, where he is a king, he is a king of Salem, but he's also a priest. And he is a valuable and an important priest because he's the priest of the Most High God. And when Abraham comes out of battle victorious, he meets with this uh, person, Melchizedek. And what happens? Melchizedek blesses Abraham because he's also a priest. No a priest would bring a blessing. So he blesses Abraham. And what does Abraham do? Abraham gave a tenth part of all, meaning he gave tithes. He gave tithes to who? He gave tithes to this figure or this individual, Melchizedek, who is a king, who is a priest. Now, the descriptions of what kind of a king is he? We see that stated here in this passage, king of righteousness. Okay, that's uh, the, the meaning of, uh, you know, Melchizedek, king of Salem. So he's the king of righteousness. Then he's also the king of peace. So Melchizedek, though Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, he also seems to be a type, a type or a picture of Jesus himself. A little complicated to understand. Well, uh, you know, uh, don't worry. If, if we get these small little things, I think we should be fine. So he is the originator of the order of priesthood for Jesus. But he is also a type of Jesus. Because who is Jesus to us? He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. Okay. Uh, and Abraham met this personality, Melchizedek, and he honored Melchizedek. So what is the point that uh, the author is trying to make? We'll come to it very soon. In verse 3, he describes Melchizedek further. Strange things, he says, without mother, without father, without genealogy, Okay, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. So he's talking about an eternal priesthood. Already he said, high priest forever. Now he's saying, this order of Melchizedek, where Melchizedek himself is the type of Jesus, made 
like the son of god priest continually no father no mother neither beginning of days nor the end of it. so who is melchizedek you know it's a it's a, a type of jesus that would be the answer now people say that uh, he was a heavenly being uh, i mean we don't know about all that but from what is being said here he's a type of jesus who appeared in the old testament uh, and abraham gave a tithe to him so what is tithe you know tithe is uh, honor worship isn't it so he gave a tithe to this person called melchizedek now let's continue uh, so that i can complete uh, and link a couple of other things verses 4 through 10 please somebody quickly verses 4 to 10 and yeah. it reads just think how great he was even the patriarch abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder now the law requires the descendants of the leva of levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people that is from their fellow israelites even though they also are descended even though they are, they are also descended from abraham this man however did not trace his descent from levi yet he collected a tent from abraham and blessed him who had the promises and without doubt the lesser is blessed by the greater in one case the tent is collected by people who die but in the other case by him who is declared to be living one might even say that levi who collects the tent pay tent true abraham because when melchizedek met abraham levi was still in the body of his ancestor yes thank you uh, say so as uh, it's it's quite self explanatory here he's trying to establish the greatness of melchizedek in comparison to aaron uh, or the you know the tribe of uh, levi um, and he's saying that somebody whom they honored which would be abraham so earlier he referred to moses and how jesus is greater than moses now he's saying abraham paid a tithe obviously in worship and honor to melchizedek so that shows us that this man melchizedek is very great Okay, the worshipper of the uh, the priest of the Most High God, so he is greater, you know, uh, than the order of priesthood that came later on in the line of Abraham, uh, which is Aaron and his descendants. So Melchizedek is greater. How else do we prove that Melchizedek is greater? Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. That means indirectly, his descendants pay tithe to Melchizedek. okay so meaning his unborn children uh, if if the father has done that the unborn children who were in his body that's his way of putting it across to uh, the believers they have paid tithe to melchizedek so he continues so having said this i want you to know that one of the rules uh, which was spoken over uh, the levitical priesthood was that they would receive tithes from the people as honor to god and you know honor to the priesthood but think about this when aaron and his descendants were in the body or here it says in the loins of abraham they have paid tithes to melchizedek so in simple terms he is establishing the greatness of melchizedek over aaron and the priesthood of the order of melchizedek is greater than the priesthood of the order of aaron or levi okay so that is his point that this is a greater priesthood and let's move on from verses 11 through 17 if someone can read that please 11 to 17 if perfection could have been attained through the levitical priesthood and indeed the law given to people the people established that priesthood 
Why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? But when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to the tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Okay, thank you, Say. And again, as it's self explanatory, basically what he's saying is if the Levitical priesthood was good enough, then we would not need another priesthood. But the way in the book of Romans we see that the law, it was given, but the law could not fulfill what God wanted, and which is why. You know, Jesus then came in as the fulfillment and he came in as the completeness, which, you know, we, we were waiting for, which was needed. Uh, and in the same manner here, Jesus became that fulfillment. Okay, He became that completeness for us. And this new line of priesthood was established. Uh, obviously, Jesus did not come from the tribe of uh, uh, Levi, but He's from the tribe of Judah, but we are not talking about the fleshly um, uh, or, you know, the, the natural uh, laws that were put in place. We're talking about something greater than that. And God established a better priesthood uh, and that priesthood fulfilled its responsibility. And this is the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus is a part of this priesthood so he is helping the people know that the lord jesus okay that he has now become a high priest and this is not on the basis of some uh, you know physical or bodily heredity or or uh, uh, descent no it's beyond that god has appointed and that's how he became then uh, we, we see that this is not on the basis of, uh, you know, some law, or some legal requirement, according to what Moses uh, pronounced. It's beyond that. And uh, he also says that another important thing is that there is indestructible and endless life associated with, uh, you know, the kind of priest that the Lord Jesus is. So he is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, what else do we see? Okay. We, we know that priests uh, were a surety for their covenant, okay, or, or actually not, not really surety. So in the uh, responsibilities of being a priest, they were mediators. So the laws were already given, all these practices were described, you know, practices of worship. So they would mediate those practices. That's how the priests actually see now that the lord jesus uh, he is not just a mediator of this new covenant which we have in christ but that he is also um, a surety for us and that's what the rest of the uh, content here covers so let's go ahead and read from verses 18 to 25. the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless for the law was made nothing perfect, and better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without an, any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. 
because he always leaves to intercede for them. Okay, thank you, Say. So we see there that uh, the former, um, you know, commandment or uh, the former ways that were set through the law, they were unprofitable and they were weak, which is why, because why do we say they were weak and they were unprofitable? Because they could not justify a human being in, in the sight of God completely. Yes, they, uh, you know, there were all these sacrifices and sin was covered, but sin was not taken away, isn't it? So when we study about the, the way atonement worked back then, it was just a covering of sin by the shedding of blood of an animal. But now we have something greater which is performed, which is that the Lord Jesus, he takes away our sin. And that's the kind of forgiveness that we are experiencing. So in that context, he says, it was unprofitable, it was weak, yeah, yeah, you know, it was uh, unable to justify a sinner before God. And then he goes on to say that now we have the Lord Jesus, not only is he able to take away our sin, we'll you know, read about that later, but uh, he helps us, as say he pointed out, draw near to God. Okay, it's a better hope that we have with God. And when we look at high priests that were appointed uh, before, you know, through through Levi and that line, uh, they, as I told us, they were mediators. But Jesus as a high priest, he uh, has this direct oath of God or God backs him up or God uh, is so sure you know, about this priesthood of the Lord Jesus. So he's backed up by God's oath, unlike the uh, other priesthood. Um, and for all these reasons, you know, Jesus is more superior. So in verse 22, there is uh, this term of surety. He's become a surety of a better covenant. So surety is the fact that the promise which we have with God, you know, already covenant is sure enough. Okay, covenant is a is an unbreakable promise in this situation, uh, simply because one of the parties, you know, it depends on the strength of uh, the parties involved. So one of the parties, which is God, who makes the covenant with us, we know that he's an eternal God, he's a just God, he's unchangeable. So the promise depends on the stronger person, not really on the weaker person. So given that it's a covenant, given that God is the one who's making the covenant, it's already sure. But in addition to that, the author is saying, oh, believers, oh, discouraged believers, through Jesus, we have a surety. So that word surety, if you look up the Greek word, it's you. Uh, uh, igios, and uh, it means something to the uh, uh, level of a co-signer. You know, when we sign, one more person signs, uh, right, in, in legal papers. So it's as good as Jesus himself has become a guarantor of this covenant, a surety that it's already sure, but extra sure that this covenant will remain and it's a new covenant it's a better covenant uh, better than what moses spoke about and so he says different things like there were uh, many priests uh, because they were prevented by death from continuing remember we said priest forever that means that uh, he's not going to be changed from his role or his position when we talk about human beings. Maybe there's a good priest. There's a not so good priest. There's a priest who is serving the Lord very well. But someone like, you know, when you talk about Eli and all in his times, things were not going well in the temple. So things can go up and down depending on the uh, enthusiasm and the commitment of a priest. But this priest can never be changed. He's already wonderful. Uh, he's become a guarantor of the covenant and he cannot be changed. So basically, it's like too good to be true, good news uh, for us. So for the Hebrew believers, this would have meant a lot, a whole lot. Uh, maybe we are struggling a little bit because of all this temple language or tabernacle language, but they understood that, wow, he's this is too good. Okay, a, cha a priest who cannot be changed. So unchangeable priesthood. 
and it goes on to say that verse 25 which i mentioned to us uh, that he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to god through him since he always lives to make intercession for them and that's the extent of his work and what a beautiful uh, scripture to stop at today uh, let's quickly pray since you all also have to go on to the next class okay yeah see our father the lord thank you for a wonderful time lord you have shared your word through our teacher through your daughter thank you lord for the hope we have in you thank you for bringing us near to the father thank you for all that you have accomplished lord in your resurrection and your death on the cross and thank you for always interceding for us thank you that indeed lord we have full hope and assurance that lord we are in you and that we are in a better covenant and that we are closer to the father than like never before through the blood that you have spilled and the lord you are always going to be our high priest we pray that these truths that we have learned lord will grow in our hearts and our lord our faith will be solidified on the truth that indeed lord we belong to you and nothing will snatch us away from you we pray against everything oh lord that will make us fall out of faith but lord we pray for grace to stay on track and stay remain and remain connected to you we thank you lord for your, your wonderful daughter lord who you've used to impact upon us this knowledge and truth we pray that lord the anointing and the revelation of your word will continue to grow and grow mightily in her life as we go into our other class, we pray for wisdom and we pray for our other teacher to impact upon us, Lord, the wisdom, Lord, required for us, Lord, for the assignment, Lord, that is ahead of us, Lord, what you're preparing us for. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you for answered prayers. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Say. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. We'll meet again next week. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor.